Well, good morning. No, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, welcome to today's panel, um, Nonprofit Sustainability in the Shadows of COVID-19. This is a, a partnership with um, Southern California grant makers, the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, and Concerned Capital. Our goal is really to bring forth information and tools the the goal of all of our panelists today is to not just supply you with information that there's you know there's been a ton of stuff out there we also just want to give you some tools like what are some of the things that we should be thinking about what are some strategies that are out there um, as we think about our own nonprofits you know not all money is good money um, as we think about our sustainability what is it going to take during this time of crises um, there's been a lot of really systemic uh, issues in the nonprofit sector. Now, just like our communities, it's really been uh, expanded. Uh, but also our needs, the needs of our communities and what we do for our communities has expanded. So today we want to sort of give you, let me give you a little bit of context about how we set up the panel and what we really want to address. So one of the things about sustainability is we talk about high performance, we talk about high impact, and all of those things are absolutely top of the line. But in this moment, um, it has really become a based on extreme need, an extreme opportunity for our, for our community. And when I say our community, I'm talking about the nonprofit sector. So when we think about all of the areas that are affecting uh, who we are or what we do and how we're there for people that need our services. We have to think about then are we going to be around in the next six months? So when you know just even looking at who we are, we are a strong force that makes up California's workforce. We generate 15% of California's gross state product. This is as of last year's uh, I don't know if you've all seen this report that is a fantastic report that comes out of non Cal nonprofits. And so it's, this is the most recent. We're still a very, very viable workforce and small businesses most of the time considered in California as, a, as well as the rest of the country. Um, we bring into California from out of state sources about $40 billion a year. We generate 273 billion dollars in annual revenue uh, we pay even though we're a nonprofit right even though we are tax tax exempt we pay more than 37 billion dollars in taxes each year we also because of our relationship to grants and foundations we import and we bring into the state an additional 1.5 billion dollars so clearly we are a strong uh, force that has a lot of economic power. So how do we really use that in this moment? You know, we also are a huge workforce. So given all of the layoffs, the, num the, the, uh, the number of people that are unemployed, uh, they're unemployed right now, many of them are coming from nonprofits as well, besides some of the other sectors. Um, we have a very diverse, uh, we are one of the most diverse of all of the small businesses in California because of who we bring to the table to do the work and work with our communities. We also contribute a huge amount through volunteers. Out of the 92, 000, over 92,000 nonprofits, 70% of our workforce is many times volunteers. So we are impacted by dollars, we're impacted by our workforce that is a diverse and ethnically diverse workforce that right now is also greatly impacted by what's happening um, around some of the uh, demonstrations and what they mean to our communities. Lastly, you know, when we think about the reality for us today, some of the questions we just have to ask ourselves, right? And so <clears throat> one of the most recent uh, polls taken through Kaiser has, uh, is asking, has your organization suffered financially due to the pandemic? 83% of them said yes. These are out of 295 responses in California nonprofits. For those that have had to cut their programs uh, or even shut down, 64% of 
for organizations that have seen an increased demand in programs due to the pandemic or the economic shutdown. 50% of those have said yes. Layoffs, and this is the part where it gets really uh, tricky, right? We are serving those communities that have suffered the economic layoffs, that economic turnout, and we're also the organizations and the individuals that are being laid off. So this, doesn't, this only leads to a perfect storm for inequity. So then are we then expecting to hire staff? Well, yeah, we would need about 79% increase in order to then fulfill the demand that is currently in front of us because of COVID and all the other inequities that we're being subjected to. So when we think about um, uh, one of the most recent, and you know, this is nothing that you don't know, right? What are some of the, the biggest needs that people are saying they're, they're experiencing right now? Um, and this is toward the end of 2019. Now this is pre-COVID. Um, and you know that this has increased twofold or threefold in many cases. So, but when we go back to then who's really being impacted by COVID and all, all of the other inequities, you know, it goes right back to the economic viability of our communities. And so those that earn less than $15,000 a year are the highest impacted community members. So if this is who we're facing, again, it's the perfect storm for inequity. So when we think about sustainability, our goal today is not just to talk about it from a perspective is you got to look at your finances. It's really more than just about money. It's about ensuring that our systems internally are prepared to support our staff who are diverse, who are the ones being impacted. This is about supporting communities that are having huge needs right now. And I know that a lot of funders are stepping in for um, emergency support, right, hotspots. Uh, but this is going beyond that. This is also thinking about then what happens after the next few months. How are we, we going to survive that? Um, so it's about a whole lot of things that make us think about sustainability in a different way. So today I want to move forward and introduce our panelists uh, because that's really who we want to hear from. Um, today, we are so pleased to have these wonderful people online. Um, so we're going to start with Dave Sheldon, representing Southern California Grant Makers. So let me, before we jump in, Dave, I'm just going to take you through a little bit about the logistics of the session today. I will be moderating in between, um, each panelist will have 15 minutes to talk about their particular area of focus. Um, we will while this is happening, we encourage you to use the chat room and start posting the questions that come up for you and just post as many as you want to have. Um, in the back end, we will be looking at those questions and we'll try to answer. Uh, we, we probably won't be able to answer as many. I mean, we only have an hour and a half. So we probably get to a few questions, but we are making a commitment and our panelists have been gracious enough to say that they will answer all of the questions that come through today and we'll develop a, um, a question and answer um, paper for you and we'll post it and send it after the, um, the webinar. So with no um, further to say, let me get started. Dave. Okay. Hi. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so as, as Veronica said, I'm Dave Sheldon. I'm the Vice President of Collaboration and Community Building at Southern California Grantmakers. I'm delighted that SCG is co-hosting today and to welcome all of you to this important discussion. The folks at CHC asked me to briefly let you know a bit about SCG, how funders are responding during this time and ways that we are working to build more supportive relationships between funders and nonprofit partners. But before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge that these are extra extraordinary times. In the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color face compounding effects of inequality, inequities. The work required to undo the deep-rooted structural and systemic racism of the past few hundred years is undeniably daunting but necessary. As a representative of the philanthropy sector, I know that we have clearly not done enough to refute the status quo. 
And I'm heartened to see that my organization and many others in my sector began to take steps towards being mindful of our privilege, being in community with others, and ultimately creating a future where Black, Indigenous, and people of color are no longer invisible, oppressed, criminalized, excluded, tokenized, weaponized, and erased. I truly hope that we will look back on this time as a turning point in the march towards true racial justice. So what is Southern California Grantmakers and who are our members? And a quick overview is that we are the regional association of grantmakers in eight counties in Southern California that does not include San Diego. Our mission is to champion effective philanthropy and advance collaborative efforts that create meaningful change in our communities. We have about 330 member organizations that come from family, private operating community and corporate foundations and corporate giving programs, government agencies, a few individual philanthropists and consultants to foundations. And SEG connects grant makers across Southern California through sector-wide conferences, trainings, networking opportunities, and funder peer groups, providing space for collaboration and coordination, coordinated action on critical issues. Our members fund just about any issue you can imagine, but also around different communities and geographies. And overall, a main focus is usually about alleviating poverty and expanding opportunity and access. And more and more, with an equity lens and a recognition of the historical and contemporary effects of racism, especially, but also sexism, homophobia, ableism, et cetera. We help our members learn about the issues they fund and about the business of grant making, expose them to new ideas and trends, and help them collaborate and use their collective voice in advocacy and policymaker education. And I need to dispel one common misconception. We are not funders ourselves. We don't give away money. So we are a nonprofit as well, and these conversations are important to us too. So how has philanthropy been responding to COVID-19? We know that in a usual year, foundations invest roughly $4.4 billion in Los Angeles County. Uh, since March, we estimate that at least 100 million additional money has been spent by foundations to organizations in LA County as a response to COVID-19. And this is early going. We expect that number to continue to climb. Some of this has been done through re pooled rapid response funds. Um, and across uh, the County of LA, there are over 17 funds that have been opened to help address the immediate needs of nonprofits, small businesses, and economically impacted individuals. We've seen also in philanthropy, though, a loosening or eliminate, elimination of restrictions on current grants. That has included converting project-based grants to unrestricted support, accelerating payment schedules, and not holding grantees responsible when conferences, events, and other project deliverables had to be postponed or canceled. Many have made new grants as unrestricted as possible, so nonprofit partners have maximum flexibility to respond to this crisis. Many have provided support to organizations created and led by the communities most affected who they normally don't fund. And a large number have reduced what they ask of their nonprofit partners, postponing reporting requirements, site visits, and other demands on their time during this challenging period. And, and we've also seen many move their previously complex uh, paper and paper grant making systems into the technology age, doing direct deposits of grant checks to get money out the door more quickly and accepting short descriptions as applications without complex financial statements. And finally, I know that most foundations are listening. They want to know what you need and they are doing their best to respond as best they can. I urge you to be clear with funders about what you need. Don't be afraid to ask for things beyond money. That could mean asking for extensions, relaxed reporting, help making a connection with another grantee or with a service provider that you don't have a good connection to, like a lawyer or an accountant or other kinds of assistance, or simply just for advice. So feel free to reach out. I'm sure the other uh, foundations will agree with that. So how are we working to change philanthropic practice and better support communities? At SAG, our hope is that many of these new practices become standard practice for our members. We are helping our members embrace the principles of trust-based philanthropy, 
which asks foundations to develop more meaningful relationships with their grantees. We champion the idea that foundations embrace multi-year general operating support as a norm and move away from project-based and single-year grants whenever possible. That they reduce onerous application processes and reporting requirements, especially with organizations that they know they are likely to support or renew. That they provide assistance beyond the grant, helping to advocate for systems change on behalf of and informed by the communities they seek to serve. And that they see themselves as a resource to you for advice and introductions to others that you might need. Frankly, we'd like to see the funder grantee power dynamic made more collaborative and less uneven. While we know that there will always be a power imbalance, we hope that our programming and, and messaging can influence foundations to examine their practices and invite nonprofit partners into more equitable conversations. While most SCG resources and programs are for funders, we do often offer programming for nonprofits as well. Currently, through our Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation project, we are offering implicit bias trainings to both funders and nonprofits, and often offer programming to learn more about Los, Angeles, Los Angeles's racial history. Details are at racialequityla.org. Later this year, we'll be relaunching our Full Cost Project, a partnership with the Nonprofit Finance Fund, thank you, Henry, and um, Philanthropy California, which includes trainings and online resources to help you assess what it really costs to achieve outcomes. These sessions allow funders and grantees to learn together how to fully assess the full costs of running a program within an organization, making the case for higher overhead rates, if not straight general operating support. And you can always use our, you can always see our web resources, including a comprehensive page of COVID-19 pooled funds that outline what type of support each fund can provide. You can see that from the link at socalgrantmakers.org. And with that, I'll end by saying thank you for letting me share a bit uh, from SCG and that I'm looking forward to hearing much more, much more interesting things from my friends on this distinguished panel. Thanks for having me and back to you, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. Really welcome that. Um, again, um, I see that there's uh, a few questions coming into our chat. Please continue to post. Um, we will try to get to them. So let me introduce the next two speakers um, um, are representing the Nonprofit Sustainability Fund. And, but we're going to start with Jennifer Banor. And Jennifer? Hi, thank you, Veronica. Um, and my colleague, Carrie, is going to be managing the slides, so I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank Veronica and Community Health Councils for their initiative and in putting this together and being so responsive to the emerging uh, issues that so many nonprofits are facing right now. Um, and um, just to introduce myself, my name is Jennifer Venor. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of the UniHealth Foundation which is a, uh, a private philanthropic foundation based here in Los Angeles and uh, focuses on uh, improving health outcomes, particularly within underserved communities. Uh, I'm not here really today specifically representing UniHealth Foundation. Instead, I'm here with my colleague, Carrie Harlow, to share more about um, an initiative that we fund at UniHealth um, called the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative. And in a few moments, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to share more about the details of NSI, but I'll start with a brief introduction about what NSI is and what we do. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, um, we launched in 2012 with, um, that came out of a, co a conversation that was going on between primarily the California Community Foundation, Weingart Foundation, and the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. And really what uh, that conversation was about was an ongoing challenge that foundations were seeing within the nonprofit sector um, in the wake of the 20, 2008 um, Great Recession and the impact, the long-term impact it was having on nonprofit sustainability. And uh, one of the issues that came up that unfortunately I think still continues is this uh, reticence to have conversations among nonprofits 
with funders around uh, strategic restructuring. I think oftentimes we think about strategic restructuring as mergers or um, sometimes sunsetting a nonprofit, but really there's actually a full range of um, avenues that strategic restructuring can take. And so NSI has really been born out of an effort to normalize strategic restructuring and to change the narrative around what it is um, to even what Dave's point was earlier, to try to invite conversations at an earlier stage to try to strengthen nonprofits um, in, in the wake of a lot of financial and operational challenges they're seeing right now and in the past. And um, so Mari will today is really less so to represent UniHealth, but really to represent all the funders who now contribute to NSI. We now have over 18 funders, um, and there are three of us who are managing funders. Uh, it's California Community Foundation, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, the Amundsen Foundation, as well as UniHealth Foundation. And so the funds are committed to, through CCF, and then our, my colleague, Carrie Harlow, is the program manager, and she helps manage the vetting and distribution of the funds through CCF. Um, as a funder, one of the reasons why UniHealth um, has committed and continues to commit to funding NSI is that we realize that there are enormous amount of financial challenges facing smaller nonprofits, um, but for us in the health sector, you know, strategic restructuring is actually quite common. You know, to hear about hospital mergers is, is commonplace and, and people don't really spend an enormous amount of time thinking about whether or not uh, it's a, a, a bad mark or not. Um, it's, it's really often seen as a strength. It's a way for different uh, hospital systems to bring together their strengths um, and then expand their footprint. Unfortunately, we don't see that as much with some smaller community-based organizations within healthcare. And so UniHealth invests in NSI because we wanna help normalize that conversation. And we want organizations to see really the larger um, capacity that they have to expand their footprint um, through these conversations with potential partners. So what Carrie's put up here on your screen now is the range of things that NSI sees coming out of strategic restructuring partnership conversations. Sometimes to your right, as you can see, there's the more common uh, understanding, which is around mergers or assets transfer, sometimes with sunsetting of organizations. But really the bulk of the outcomes we see is around the other two to your left. So we, we help initiate conversations or support conversations, I should say, um, between nonprofits that may be out of those conversations. They start sharing staff, they co-locate, sometimes they're shared back office cooperation, and then also sometimes there's an even less formal, but also uh, I think more collaborative outcome that we see around coalitions and then collective impact. Um, and I think one of the things that we've seen from our learnings over the past eight years is really a, a sense that um, one way to think about and perhaps normalize conversations around strategic restructuring is that Instead of thinking about organizational impact um, and organizational sustainability, what if we change the narrative or change the question to be, what does it mean to have mission sustainability? And if we start to focus on mission sustainability, then I think it opens up a lot of breathing room. It brings more oxygen into the room and allows us to I think uh, strategize and problem solve in ways that we sometimes are limited by when we think about things in just a narrow organizational definition. Um, Carrie, if you don't mind bringing us to the next slide. So in terms of the way NSI works, we do give out grants. Um, there are two types of grants that organizations are able to apply for. And one thing I want to lift up is that uh, the expectation is that there will be at least two, if not more, organizations coming together to apply for these grants. So um, the first one is a negotiation grant, which allows the, 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 the three or two or three entities or more to hire a consultant and start to facilitate conversation and negotiations, both at the staff and at the board level. Um, as you can see here, 93% of our survey respondents felt that hiring a third-party consultant facilitator was either important or essential. Um, having someone with the expertise and background to help direct these conversations has made the process significantly easier for organizations as they look at strategic restructuring. 
And then the second kind of grant, oftentimes um, entities that had a negotiation grant um, can come to us again for a second round of funding with an integration grant. And this facilitates or funds one-time costs direct, directly related to implementation. Um, and so uh, what we find is that the grants tend to range from approximately $20,000 to $40,000 each. Um, and that gives you a sense of the, the cost that is often incurred with just even having these kinds of conversations. The kinds of conversations that, as I said, uh, both UNHealth and all the funders who fund NSI are, are very much in support of funding. So with that, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Carrie Harlow, who is the program manager for NSI, and she's going to walk you through a little bit more about how we work and the types of projects we fund. Thank you, Jen. Um, I thought I'd also just add by, by reflecting, I think a common misperception is that we're just talking about the transfer or sharing of, of assets like organizational reserves or property owned by the organizations. Um, but really, we're thinking a lot more about the transfer or sharing of other types of assets, such as human capital, the talent within the organizations, the institutional knowledge that needs to be passed along and shared, um, program design. And I think um, going back to Jen's earlier comment about sort of broadening what, how we consider strategic restructuring um, to think about um, program and mission preservation um, is, is something that we're, we're really leaning into right now. Um, I'll move on to cover, okay, advance the slide here, um, just a few statistics uh, to give you a sense of the scale of the initiative. We've worked with 242 different nonprofits who have participated in the exploration of 90 different partnerships to date. Um, we've seen 50 partnerships come together from those conversations, 29 of them mergers, 21 of them other types of sustained collaborations. We see uh, 25 are still in process, so we don't yet know what the outcome of those negotiations will be. Um, and we have made 37 integration grants to date and that, as Jen said, it was for one-time implementation costs um, after an agreement has been reached. Um, and the initiative has distributed over $4 million in grant funds to support this work so far. Um, and this just gives you an example um, or just a picture into what it looks like by program area. You'll see that um, nearly 35% of the organizations um, who have come to NSI for support in pursuing strategic restructuring agreements are serving youth and families. Um, nearly 22% are in human services. That includes community development agencies, housing, advocacy, legal aid. Um, it's 18% are healthcare organizations, nearly 12% education institutions, nearly 13% arts organizations, and just a couple working in the area of animal welfare. So a pretty broad spectrum, as you can see. We wanted to give you um, two quick examples of how different outcomes can look um, regarding a strategic restructuring exploration. And the first one is Arts for Incarcerated Youth Network. And many of you joining us today probably are already familiar with their work. Um, the origin story is that in 2014, executive directors of six nonprofits who were working with incarcerated youth began meeting. Um, I think once every three months, they were just looking for ways to support one another. Um, the conversation became formal um, and a negotiation funded by NSI in 2015, and they worked with facilitator Seed Collaborative, um, at the time was going by Hudson, the name of Hudson and Holland. Um, their motivations were that they were all sharing challenges in working with the probation department, um, and they desired to come together to get greater probation department buy-in for their programs, um, provide multidisciplinary arts programming at all LA County detention facilities and youth reentry programs, and they created a network. They had 14 member agencies. Each organization continues to operate both independently and through the network. And this um, is, I, I think, one of the, the greatest, the, the beautiful thing about the design of the network and also probably what they would say is their greatest challenge is managing individual organizational needs and collective needs all at the same time. Um, but 
but the impact is indisputable. They gained independent 5013C status as a network in 2017. They have tripled their operating budget in three years, exceeding $3 million in funding um, this year. And they've achieved greater buy-in among probation staff. They've collectively coordinated professional development opportunities to bring probation staff into the work that they're doing. Um, and they've reduced redundancy by coordinating programming, increasing coverage at more remote facilities. They've expanded from six sites to, I believe, 22 today. Um, so that's a really impressive example of an outcome of what started as a really informal conversation and became a formal NSI negotiation and today is um, grown into something so much more. The next example is a more traditional merger. Um, this is between Hillsides and Bienvenidos, two organizations serving youth and family, families engaged in the child welfare system. The resulting strategic affiliation in 2017 enabled both administrative consolidation and significant cost savings, as well as increased impact in the communities that they serve. Um, in this case, uh, the catalyst for the conversation was an executive transition. The longtime executive director of Bienvenidos Children's Center was looking to retire in 2015. Um, and I, I hear that he had conversations with nine potential partners before moving forward with Hillsides as um, the most compatible partner. And they felt that they were compatible both um, in terms of their financial models and their program models. So um, in terms of being compatible financially, Bienvenidos was primarily dependent on cost reimbursement contracts. They had very little financial cushion, whereas Hillsides had a more robust development capacity um, and diversified revenue streams, and they felt that they could be stronger together. Um, and then in terms of programmatic compatibility, Hillsides was looking to expand into foster placement and adoption services Bienvenidos offered an expertise in this area, as well as prevention and early intervention services. So it made a lot of sense. Um, they hoped to achieve economies of scale together. They could invest in building up their joint administrative infrastructure. Um, they cr came together as a combined $30 million organization, now over $40 million, I believe. Um, so they're growing. And together they were able to expand programming, centralizing intake, um, minimizing wait lists, expanding services in East LA, um, and they worked together to become compliant with the continuum of care reform legislation, AB 403. Um, but the process, I mean, this is a big story, right? It, lot, big numbers, <laughs> big organizations, um, but they themselves identified challenges in, in going through the process. It's time consuming. In this case, they worked with a different facilitator, NPO Solutions. Um, the process of, of exploring a negotiation took four months, over 60 meetings, I'm told, among various stakeholders. Um, and they, they had some challenges to address. Um, they had to address uh, some PR issues. There were rumors during the process that Bienvenidos was closing its programs, that they had to address that. Um, they had to combine public funding contracts, which was challenging. And then this is something that is true of, I think, all strategic restructuring conversations navigating merging two organizational cultures. Um, and this just speaks to the importance of having a skilled facilitator to walk them through the process using best practices. Um, and the impact in the end was that Bienvenidos became a subsidiary of the larger Hillsides organization, which freed up um, almost immediately, I think, $1 million in back office and leadership integration cost savings that they were able to invest in achieving staff parity um, and in expanding programs. So another really great example, um, but you see the spectrum that, that they're very different. Um, and there are so many other examples of cases that we could share. I wanted to take a minute um, to just share what we've learned since 2012 when the initiative was founded. Um, the first thing is that strategic restructuring is a strengths-based tool. It's most successful, we have found, and the data shows this nationally, that it's most successful when organizations come to it strategically, not in a moment of financial crisis. Negotiations can last uh, three to 18 months, depending on the circumstances. So we find that it's better to do the financial scenario planning early and explore potential partnerships well before cash depletes to the point of insolvency 
And I think this is a particularly important principle today um, in a post-COVID context where those community organizations without former access to traditional institutional funding and networks of wealth are particularly vulnerable and fragile. And we need to examine the role implicit bias plays here, consider how to support those organizations and being able to access strategic restructuring as a tool um, and a process successfully. The second, the second piece here is readiness um, as a key predictor of success. So we, we think about readiness in terms of capacity. So leadership time to de dedicate to the process, financial viability to see the process through, we touched on that. Also mission alignment, cultural compatibility, trust among partners, um, and realistic expectations. So um, another thing I like to note is that oftentimes the conversation is initiated by executive directors um, and driven by them, uh, but it always involves board engagement. Um, that's a, a key predictor of success is getting that board buy-in early on and having them be part of the conversation. Um, and then the third, third piece is um, that NSI defines success not in outcome, but in the value gained from the exploration process itself. Um, we have heard, we, we do surveys among those that have participated in the process, 100% of organizations who have completed an NSI negotiation, whether or not it came to an agreement, shared that they got value out of the process itself. Most organizations report that their participation positively impacted board engagement, internal clarity and strategic direction, ability to think strategically, increased financial strategy and awareness, openness to future potential partnerships, and their external reputation. So this is an, an important uh, principle for the initiative and, and something I always want to share. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to share a little bit of some of our work on the national um, scale. So for the last couple of years, NSI has been meeting with like initiatives across the country in attempt to model collaboration ourselves as funder initiatives and to build the field in this area, to normalize this conversation on a national scale. To date, there are initiatives in Arizona, Dallas, Philadelphia, New York, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. And together we're implementing a shared evaluation tool to better tell the story of strategic restructuring as a tool for sustainability. Um, we just pu published an article in um, SSIR, which you see here on the presentation. Um, and then also we've launched a website with um, a toolkit for nonprofits that are interested in engaging in the work, some things for them to start thinking about and some resources for them. And then also for funders that are interested in engaging in the work. Um, so I encourage you to, to take a look um, when you're able at both of those resources. Um, so I just wanted to pause here and, um, and acknowledge that while we think that now more than ever before, strategic restructuring will be a useful tool. Um, it is just one solution among many that we will need to pursue in our sector. And um, Jen and I are, are both honored to, to be here with our fellow panelists to eager, eager to continue the conversation about how we can preserve and sustain the critical work happening in our communities today. And um, yeah, we're just uh, happy to answer questions. And I know we're gonna get to those later, but I. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Veronica. I'm going to end my screen share here. All right. Thank you so much, both of you. That's, that's um, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to introduce our next panelist, Tomas Duran from Concerned Capital. I want to thank you all for uh, having me here today, and I'm excited to share what I do and what Concern Capital does um, to support social enterprise and creating sustainable sources of income for nonprofits, as well as addressing uh, community needs. So I'm going to go over a brief presentation and highlight some of the points that we um, we use, but I also um, want to talk about uh, some of the challenges. And I'll give you an example of a, a social enterprise that we started with a local nonprofit. And um, it's been going on for a couple of years now and they're doing uh, pretty well. So Concern Capital is a for-profit social benefit corporation. That's intentional. We're trying to create grassroots economic development strategies that raise the floor that can be re um, replicated and can be, um, that are scalable and regardless of the context. 
the image you see on the bottom uh, left corner of your, your screen is a, a bicycle. It's a, the uh, sprog for bicycles, right? The, we don't see, and that's kind of our, our icon because we don't see ourselves as being the one entity that can do it all, as opposed to being one of the many tools available to you in order to make you work more efficiently and to help the things move forward. So what we do is we facilitate uh, strategic investments. We bring uh, together funders from a variety of different sources we, um, with a focus on creating and sustaining jobs. We also wanna create um, sustainable strategies for our clients, whether they're for-profit businesses or, or nonprofits. And then lastly, one of the things that we, um, how we achieve this is by shifting existing resources. We don't think you always need to create a new tool to solve the challenge that's in front of you. Sometimes it's about just existing an existing resource that's being applied inefficiently or in a way that other people haven't really considered. We do this with social enterprises. Um, we like social enterprises um, with nonprofits because they create unrestricted income. They could be used to um, incentivize um, employees in terms of um, bonuses and those sorts of things to keep real good quality people there with your organization. It could also be the thing that allows you to weather the challenges when the funding sources you traditionally use start to change their priorities or start to move on into something else. We think it can be uh, helpful to increase the stability of the organization as well as um, uh, really anchor yourselves in the communities that you work in. It can help provide uh, jobs as well as new goods and services, and as well as have a very strategic impact in the community that you're dedicated to serving. Now, the image that I use on this slide is a young man at the top of the Yosemite Falls Trail in Yosemite. The reason I use this is because the vista is gorgeous. And when we talk about social enterprise, a lot of times the conversation we have with the executive directors is about this wonderful outcome, the end of the journey, right? The part uh, that often gets loud, left out is the terrifying um, passage that goes up to this. Now, I, when I hike this trail, there's, there's times when you're going up a staircase on the side of the, the cliff face and I'm on my hands and knees terrified because it, I perceive to be a lot of risk and there's a lot of young people and older people just walking around me like it's nothing because that perception of risk is always gonna be internal. And for nonprofits that are considering social enterprise, one of the things you wanna get comfortable with is that your board may have a different perception of risk. Your funders may have a different perception of risk. And so you wanna to get to that beautiful outcome, but along the way, you're gonna to have to figure out ways to mitigate that risk. One of the ways that we like doing that is by recycling an existing business. So I, I was super excited hearing uh, the presenters before talking about the, um, this fund to, to recycle these existing nonprofits and bring in new leadership and allowing people to transition out and preserving those, those kinds of services. We do this all the time with private businesses. And we think it's a really, a really great way to, um, for a nonprofit to enter into a social enterprise because there's a lot of businesses that need a transition. And that's, um, and the image that you see in the background is you can either start up and, cl and climb and look for footholds and, and, and make the, the track the difficult way, or you can take the ladder, which is just around the corner and have an easier path. Because those startups, they don't have a demonstrated need sometimes, but the existing business does. It has a track record. As well as the company is gonna have some risks that, that are known and can be mitigated. And also, job impact is much easier to measure with an existing company. When you're going in and saying, oh, I love this project, it's gonna create a thousand new jobs. Well, okay, a thousand new jobs is fantastic, but it's a real challenge to, to create a story or to create that path to get there. But when you have an existing company that has 800 jobs already or 80 jobs or eight jobs, and the infusion of new capital and vision is gonna allow that company to go from eight to 16, that's really impactful and you can measure and you can talk about that. And those are things that are um, Im um, almost immediate types of successes. One of the projects that we did this with is with the Va Valley Jewish Community Center here in, San in the San Fernando Valley. This is a long standing community uh, service center, social service provider in the Valley. Um, they've been doing day camps. They, have a, they operate a senior center. They do cultural events. It's, it's um, been around for a really long time. Their great challenge was that they had declining membership and revenues. And what was basically happening over time, their memberships were either moving away or they were passing on. And for whatever reason, they weren't able to encourage younger families to come through and to continue to participate in their programs. So when they came to us, what we did, went through, we went through a strategic um, a strategy exercise. 
in terms of what were their capacities? What are the things that they're good at? Where are they comfortable? Where is the acceptable level, acceptable level of risk from the board? And how do we get them to go just beyond that? Who are new board members they need to add who can help mitigate whatever risk is perceived in that operating business? What funders are gonna be able to come in and wanna support what's going on? And so we went through this whole process to figure out how can they create a strategy that is responsive to the needs of their local community and to the people that they wanna serve and create a sustainable source of income. The outcome was a daycare because what they were finding was the young couples and the uh, people with uh, parents of young children weren't participating in their events because they didn't have to work, because they didn't have childcare, or because they were so focused on their day-to-day -day lives, they weren't able to interact with the special events that were being um, promoted by uh, the Jewish Community Center. So what we did is we helped them find an existing daycare, evaluate its operations, find ways that it could improve those operations, put together the funding for that, that, the purchase of that, and then help them create a business plan for how it was gonna grow over time. Now, this was a process that took several years, but it's been in operation for about a year and a half. They continue to increase the number of seats that, that they're able to serve. They're able to serve the entire community. It's not just focused or, or it's not uh, focused on, um, on just a Jewish community, but it's a daycare that provides services for everybody. But they do a, a lot of cultural, Jewish cultural events. And what they're seeing is a resurgence in membership. And they're seeing an increase in revenue. Now, it's not going to be the thing that saves the day for, for them and creates a, a, a completely, um, they're still dependent on all the other fundraising and things that they're doing. But this is a nice uh, way to increase that revenue and provide that service. This is scary space, like I said earlier, there's a lot of risk, but there's also a lot of entities that are already there and that are willing to come in and support. At the center of it all is philanthropy. But you already have those relationships. And I know that they're also thinking about, like was just said earlier, they're thinking about ways they can be innovative and supportive of you as you seek more sustainable funding or how to um, just create more sustainability for your company overall. There's public entities like the city of Los Angeles. There's educational entities like the Cal State Universities. There's federal entities. And they have a ton of resources that are available. You just know how to pitch them in the right way or package what you're doing in the way that makes sense to them. That's one of the nice things and one of the benefits about coming in and buying an existing business. There is already a track record that tells the story. There's already a group of people who are doing and implementing those things. There may already be facilities, so you're not starting from the ground up. That doesn't mean you can't take it and put a spin on it so that it is your own, but it's already starting 15 steps ahead of trying to create something out of the, out of the ground. We are in an unprecedented time, not only because of the COVID pandemic, not only because of uh, the resulting recession or the um, country's renewed um, paying attention to the fact that Black Lives Matter. And that is a lot of social tension that's happening right now. And in the midst of all this, we have one of the, uh, the beginning of one of the greatest transitions of wealth that the world has ever seen. Because as baby boomers retire, as they sell their businesses, as they move on to whatever is next, there's a gaping void behind them. And there's a great opportunity for local stakeholders, people who understand what the community needs to come in and provide some of those services. Well, we're doing a project with, um, with CHC on addressing the uh, food desert in South Los Angeles. And, and it's, it's a process that was something we've been working on for quite some time. But that's a wonderful example of a local stakeholder who knows exactly what needs to be done, bringing together the parties that need to be part of it. And we're gonna use existing funding sources and just gonna tweak them a little bit to have the outcome that everybody wants. So I know I threw a lot at you. I know that I talked about a lot of different things. I am happy to expand on all these things. Here's my contact information. Um, if there's a way that we can support you and your nonprofit as you go through or are exploring the um, Social Benefit Corporation, please reach out to us. We're happy to help. Right. Thank you so much, Tomas. That was definitely a lot of information. So I also want to let you know that we will be sharing the slides um, and, and so the contact information of all the panelists. So if you do want to reach out to them separately, we encourage you to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you, Tomas. Okay, well, I would like to invite Michelle Burton um, 
our own Michelle Burton from Community Health Councils. Um, Michelle? All right, thank you, Veronica. And thank you, uh, Jen and Carrie and Tomas and Henry and Dave. I'm super excited to uh, share this space with you today and everybody who is calling in. Um, you know, really briefly, uh, like many of you, um, I have, you know, almost three decades of nonprofit <laughs> and social sector experience behind me. I know I only look like I'm 16, but uh, it is true. Um, so what I want to talk about is, you know, a few years ago, a friend of mine um, and I that have been doing fundraising for so long said that we were going to write a book together called Fire Your Development Director, uh, because we had been development directors for a long time and realized that there's been a real shift. And so the last few years, I've really committed myself to working with um, and for nonprofits uh, and, and funders and, um, and also um, social entrepreneurs who are interested in, in really accelerating this shift um, away from traditional you know, fundraising and towards a new paradigm, which you know, Tomas did a great uh, you know, uh, example of um, exemplifying that shift, right? Um, but even with that shift, uh, the traditional ways of doing things is still is, is really still the accepted practice, I think, in our field of, of work. So I just want to, you know, kind of shake things up a little bit and, and get folks to realize that, you know, we're asking you to have a new mindset. You know, this, this isn't um, business as usual, and we understand that. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, so nonprofit sector versus social sector. Remember, <laughs> for those of you who used to watch Arsenio Hall, and he used to do that, things that make you go, hmm, right? So I'm gonna pretend that you all just did that with me because that's what we all used to do when he said it. Um, and, and the thing that makes me go, hmm, is if you think about the rest of the world actually refers to our sector as the social sector, right? Like if you go into, uh, over to Europe or into Canada, they talk about the social sector. The nonprofit sector is really a, a, a very American term. And when you think about that, it sort of plays into, you know, what's wrong <laughs> with our system uh, today. You know, when you look at all the protests that are happening, um, you know, and that have been happening for a long time, you know, why is it that those of us in the nonprofit sector, you know, we know that something's not working, right? We know that we've been working a long time to affect impact um, in areas where things are still the same, right? I started my work um, as a 16 year old at the, on the heels of the LA riots. And so, um, like many people, I'm frustrated. You know, I, I want to know why after almost you know, three decades, things are, are, are still not the way where they should be, right? So when you look at the word social, you know, it means needing companionship and therefore best suited um, you know, to living communities and relating to society, right? Nonprofit just means not making a profit. <laughs> you know, so even that in and of itself, because words matter to me, I'm a big word geek. I, I think to myself, okay, I've all, I, I, I want to be a part of a social sector. I don't want to be a part of a nonprofit sector because social has a lot more meaning. So that's why when we go to the next slide and we're looking at this, um, this idea of, of social enterprise, right? And social enterprising. Uh, the rise of social enterprise is a key performance indicator, I think, for our society, right? Uh, for those of you who are into KPIs, right? So a, a key performance indicator is, is something that you track and measure to understand whether or not the area in which you're, you want to impact, if you're really making movement towards it, right? And so for me, the rise of social enterprise is an indicator that our society and our sector is starting to better understand how we can move towards real social change, right? So the social enterprise is a great indicator of how we move towards social change, meaningful social change. What does that mean? You know, why is there a rise in social enterprise? So this uh, figure dictates that, you know, there's a decrease, there's a decrease in people's, I think, acceptance of a very traditional, and paternalistic way of doing philanthropy, um, which is really around this monetization and exploitation of need and poverty. And, and this is an ongoing issue in our sector, right? Where people feel really um, challenged about how to continue highlighting the work that they do without feeling like they're exploiting communities, our own communities, right? And so the rise in social enterprise is really about an increase in our interest to, to move from this traditional paradigm to one that's about strategic partnerships. You heard that talked about by 
you know, Carrie and Jen and Tomas um, and capitalizing on our inherent value of communities and people, right? Capitalizing on our inherent value. That's a very, very different paradigm than kind of this paternalistic model of philanthropy, this idea of charity to wait a minute, we have strengths and we have values and there's different ways that we can go about this. Let's go to the next slide. So when you look at social enterprise, again, we come back to, you know, the sweet spot, right? It's sort of this, this territory between being a traditional, you know, nonprofit and being a traditional business. And it's a space that's not exclusive to um, nonprofits. It's something that you see a lot of uh, for-profit entrepreneurs starting to um, take advantage of. And so I want to differentiate between you know, social enterprising and just having a social enterprise. Next slide. So back to this idea of retraining your brain. <laughs> so, you know, being a traditional fundraiser is kind of like playing Yahtzee. It's like, you know, we, we, we kind of shake up a whole bunch of ideas and then we throw things out there. We're gonna have events. We're gonna do, you know, um, individual giving. And, you know, we're gonna hope <laughs> on blind faith that we raise you know, millions of dollars this year. Like we've done this as fundraisers for years. Um, social enterprising is actually about being much more strategic, right? It's not about sort of that hope and a prayer of fundraising that we're used to. You know, for those of you who have led organizations, um, who have been fundraisers, you understand that it's, you know, every year the CEO comes to you and they say, okay, we need to raise, you know, X number of millions of dollars. And then they just tell you to go figure it out. And so you go bust out your Yahtzee uh, gear <laughs> and you shake it up <laughs> and you see what dice is rolled. Um, so the reason that I am advocating that we move away from that is that it's not sustainable, um, which is why we're facing right now the Center for Nonprofit Management uh, his, his did a, um, um, I know Southern California grant makers is working with them to produce a panel where they're going to release uh, their data that shows about 20% of nonprofits are looking at closing right now. And many of them are led by people of color, you know, and that's because uh, for obvious reasons, you know, there's not as much access uh, to capital and, you know, going out and relying on philanthropy, relying on individual giving, relying on special events just isn't going to cut it. And so if we move to the next slide, you know, there is an alternative uh, to that approach to sustainability and to fundraising. So one of the things that you've heard all day, you know, today on this panel has not been about traditional fundraising, right? We're talking about nonprofit sustainability. And what I'm really excited about is nobody said, let's go have a gala, <laughs> right? So the answer isn't go have a gala. <laughs> the answer is how do you think more strategically you know, about how to be a social enterpriser. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's, an, it's a verb. How do you think and change your mindset from the one of traditional sort of fundraising, which is like write another grant, have another event, make more phone calls to people you don't know and see if they'll give you money, versus how do you think strategically about your organization and what sort of value proposition that you have inherently within your institutions and within your communities. And so I wanted to give you a few examples. So, you know, I, I worked actually with Girl Scouts for five years, and they're a great example of an organization that's been using social enterprise um, as a part of their model, um, you know, for many, many decades. And, and so they're, they're one that we're all familiar with. And the reason that it's valuable is because it's not about um, you know, monetizing on, on any specific product. Social enterprising is about not only, um, you know, creating an earned income stream, it's about instilling value, you know, in the communities that you serve, right? So you're looking at a, a, an organization that has taken the population of young girls and women and used the ability to, to teach them their own enterprising skills that they can take with them. And while doing that, it sustains the organization through the revenue. So there's this real holistic approach to community building, to impact, right? And to engaging everyone in this process versus this other paternalistic model where you're just asking for dollars and you're sort of, you know, not, not purposefully, but really feeling like you have to exploit this community of, 
you know, need in order to get people to give. It's a very different model. It's a very different way of doing things. And I really think it advances equity, you know, in a, in a new way um, that we're all striving for, whether we're doing it in our nonprofits or in our foundations, you know, we're striving towards equity and really social enterprising as a way to do that. Um, Homeboy, I mean, you know, if you don't know Homeboy by now, um, you know, then, then you should. So Homeboy Industries and, and Father Boyle's organization is another fantastic example um, of an organization that has learned how to take social enterprising again and, and use it as a tool not only to help sustain the organization, to, but to uh, show and showcase the inherent value and the inherent worth of the communities and the populations that they're seeking to serve, right? So social enterprising is, is a way to, you know, build and showcase the self-efficacy and the agency that we all have as individuals, right? As opposed to otherizing the folks that you're trying to serve, you engage the people that you serve in their own opportunity, you know, to, to build their path towards self-sufficiency, right? And so at the Social Change Institute, which is our social enterprise, uh, community health councils, which again, you know, was born out of the Los Angeles riots, um, you know, spent many years being conveners and partners, you know, with funders, but we hit a, a point several years ago where we realized in order to, you know, further our own sustainability, uh, Veronica Flores, when she came in after the long time um, founder, Lark Gilliam Galloway, uh, passed away after 25 years of incredible leadership. Uh, the organization was also in a place where, you know, we needed to think about how we might change um, in order to remain relevant and to continue the legacy of the work that the organization, um, you know, had done. And so the way in which we, uh, you know, looked at that was through social enterprises. You know, and Veronica Flores is the new CEO really seen that, okay, hey, entrepreneurship and social enterprising is a way in which we can do that. We didn't have a traditional donor base. Um, we didn't have, um, you know, big, huge galas or events that we had done. Uh, so what we had was a long history of working in collaboration with nonprofits and with funders and with the county and the state you know, to affect change. And so we looked at how do we bring value to that? So let's go to the last slide. And so what we figured is that we do have value, right? And we do have a voice and we have volition, right? We have the ability, you know, to look at all of the opportunities around us and to figure out how we form strategic partnerships and how we, you know, capitalize on all of the strengths of the organization and the individual staff and the communities that we serve and have been able to parlay that into a consultancy. Um, we're also um, investing in South LA through a uh, development project that Tomas alluded to uh, that will be a hub at 94th and Broadway where we have partnered with Los Angeles Care Health Plan, with CLA and with Seeds of Hope to create an ecosystem that responds to the need for food access and food justice in South LA. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is I'm a big book hog. The Alternative by Mauricio Miller really speaks to, um, you know, what we've talked about today, which is how do we look differently at our work? How do we look differently at just, you know, not being nonprofit sector, but really being social agents and social change agents and recognizing our inherent value um, as community members and as people, um, as, as, as social enterprisers in order to better advance our own sustainability for impact. Because if we keep doing things the way that we're doing them, we're definitely not going to survive. So let's go to the last slide. I always like to end with this, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, which means um, we know that there are structural problems with our institutions in the nonprofit sector and in the philanthropic sector. And so we have to think radically and we have to think boldly about how to shift the way we think and how to do things differently. And I think all of the speakers that you're hearing from today are giving you wonderful ways in which to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. As always, fantastic. Um, and I want to introduce now our very last speaker, Henry Ramos.
Um, and I think, you know, he's another one of, of our presenters. And I think Henry, if at the very end, I don't know if you're going to do it on your presentation, but to really push your book, because I think it also really gives some perspective on changing sort of a, the mindset of, of um, nonprofits and the community around how we think about fundraising and sustainability. Veronica, thank you for that shout out. I really appreciate it. And I'll try to kind of squeeze in a little uh, self publicity in here before the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for the invitation from the uh, Community Health Councils and SCG. And thanks to all of you for making time for a really important and timely conversation. Um, I want to extend major kudos to the prior speakers. I was mesmerized and just taking copious notes. I, I hope I can add value without being too repetitive because they've really covered all the essential points, but I, I will humbly try. So um, I'm Henry Ramos. I'm an independent philanthropy advisor and a recovering foundation professional. Um, uh, I'm here today, however, in my role as the board chairman of the nonprofit finance fund. And for those of you that don't know, NFF, as we call it, is a New York-based but very nationally active uh, lender and technical assistance provider, one of the leaders in the space across the country. Um, our office in Los Angeles, as uh, most of you know, uh, is led by very strong professionals that we have in Southern California, uh, including leaders like Christina Dixon, who's our new CFO, Claire Knowlton, who's been our longtime director of consulting services, and Trella Walker, who serves as our national uh, uh, lead or, or thought leader, if you will, on our expanding efforts in uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we currently oversee about $150 million in uh, outstanding loans and technical assistance programs to nonprofit organizations and social enterprises. So I'm very thrilled that uh, Tomas brought that into play and uh, that Michelle seconded the emotion. And we have, like most of us need to, an, a very aggressive increasing focus on work uh, of community-based organizations led by and for communities and people of color. Uh, and this is because that we know, as you know, we've all known for a long time, that the history of lending in these communities is anything but fair and accessible. And because we know now more than ever that the greatest need and the greatest opportunity for the solutions that we all seek resides in the very communities that are most directly affected by inequality. So we conduct regular surveys uh, across the nation to speak directly to nonprofit leaders so that we can learn from them. Uh, and we base our priority work largely on their feedback. Our most recent survey consisted of nearly 500 nonprofit uh, executives in response to the current crisis. Um, and the, the, basically what they reported back is, you know, what we all know. Uh, the recent feedback from the field paints a very disconcerting picture. We know that many essential nonprofit organizations are unable to operate effectively right now, um, but that their costs continue to increase and to mount even while they're suffering major revenue uncertainty and their client and community needs are obviously shifting and increasingly uncertain. Our feedback shows that nonprofits are experiencing unprecedented challenges in this moment related to staff and volunteer availability, uh, service and cost recovery interruptions, destabilizing conditions, major shifts in demand, and reduced grants and contract support. Because all uh, of the inherent disequilibrium that uh, we see built into the situation is in play. We think conservatively that as many as 25% of the nonprofits operating before the COVID-19 shutdown possibly will not be in business when all is said and done. That's a pretty daunting uh, piece of data. Moreover, the lion's share of groups that are at greatest risk uh, are working in poor communities of color, as I alluded earlier. And so their expanding vulnerability will create major new pockets of social and economic challenge for our state and our nation if and as they go under. Sadly, we know that recent relief and recovery efforts by both government and philanthropy have largely overlooked smaller and more diverse nonprofits. According to new survey uh, information released recently by the Global Strategy Group, which is conducted on behalf of the Color of Change organization and Unidos US, a paltry 12% of black and Latino business owners or nonprofit and social enterprise leaders who applied for PPP loans reported actually receiving assistance. In effect, recent data suggests that many of the inequities that characterize the space prior to COVID have been amplified in our current new reality. And this suggests that much more needs to be done to correct for the continuing undervaluation and disregard for the sustainability of essential frontline nonprofits serving these communities. Gratefully, there are concrete things that we can do to position ourselves better for the future, like those that 
we've heard from our prior speakers, particularly Jen and Carrie in their remarks. Here I'm talking about strategic alliances and uh, collaborations, mergers, as well as supporting new economy models, building on shared back office, co-programming and joint staff arrangements. These are all important options that should be seriously looked at. Um, and hopefully uh, we can kind of, you know, help our nonprofits by reducing their cost burdens and enhancing their impacts through these kinds of mechanisms. Above all, uh, we should be heeding what the nonprofit leaders themselves are telling us that they need. These are things that all of you on the line probably are saying yourselves. More flexible funding, general operating support, as we've heard, working capital in the form of emergency and recovery funds, and funds especially that are dedicated specifically to help their media's clients and staff through the worst of this moment. So in our internal discussions at the Nonprofit Finance Fund, we say that we are haunted, but not undaunted. We are haunted, but undaunted, I should say. Uh, and that's to say that there's a lot to be concerned about in this moment, but we are certainly not powers, powerless, and nor are we hopeless. Um, while recognizing the severity of the moment, it's important to asset frame this. Even our most vulnerable community nonprofits are strikingly resilient, creative, and effectively shifting as best they can how they deliver their service in often inspiring ways and in a difficult context, obviously. Our job is to rally the sector however we can to build on those embedded assets so that they can succeed and help us to land in a better space when this is all over. To that end, we're encouraging our clients and our partners to focus carefully in this passage on the mission that they exist to serve and asking hard questions about the core rationale and the means of their continued operation. In some instances, this reflection may lead nonprofit groups to cut programs or services in order to preserve their core or enter into strategic partnerships or other arrangements of the kind that we heard about earlier that ultimately could lead them to substantially downsize or even in many cases close. But ultimately, we have to do what's best for our communities. In some spaces, happily, diverse community nonprofits may actually be poised to come out of this in much better shape because of many of the things that we've heard about in terms of available strategies. And recent events are accelerating the pace and imperatives of innovation to sustain them in this new future. Many have discovered that they can serve clients more effectively through virtual engagements that don't require so much uh, travel or in-person meeting. That's often not the case, but in some cases it is. Um, some have forged new partnerships with larger entities like local hospitals or social enterprises that will create new possibilities for them in the future, the kind that we heard about from Tomas. And some have even increased uh, their uh, federal support and foundation grants to sustain, sustain themselves. But frankly, as things now stand, best case scenarios like these are highly exceptional, at least until and unless we do more as a, as a field. And that means both aggregating and harnessing private charitable investment while advocating very hard for more significant public support for independent sector organizations and communities of color. And on this point, I wanna say that um, uh, we have been very pleased at the Nonprofit Finance Fund in recent months to be able to align, particularly in and around New York and other parts of the country, with major leading foundation executives, Darren Walker at the Ford Foundation, leaders at the New York Community Trust, ourselves and a handful of other social investors, a couple of months ago created, created a nearly $100 million uh, loan and uh, emergency fund for New York area human resources and arts organizations that we would like to see replicated in other regions around the country. Also today, you may have heard that Darren Walker at Ford and four of his leading uh, CEO counterparts at organizations like the Kellogg Foundation and MacArthur Foundation have committed to essentially taking out social bonds to enhance their ability to make grants over the coming years to the tune of four to five additional billions of dollars that they will be able to leverage as a result. So it would be wise for us to see about possibilities to harmonize our efforts in the form of collective advocacy to see how we can interface and interact constructively with our philanthropic and corporate leadership to replicate these kinds of efforts in Southern California. As we see it at the Nonprofit Finance Fund, we have to look at the road ahead in three iterative buckets of focus, and that's what you see on your screen right now. This first bucket on the left entails the, the phase that we are presently in, and that is the response phase, where nonprofit leaders are essentially on their heels, trying to make the most of the situation, address immediate needs, and stabilize their operations, their service, and their advocacy. 
The second phase, which is still ahead of us in information, is where we begin to regain some modicum of normalcy, some renewed sense of capacity growth and dynamism in our work. And we're going to see how we do on that in the coming months. The final stage, which is really the ultimate destination and marker for our, our success, though, is a resilience phase where most uh, strategic and forward-looking nonprofits are positioned to better withstand these kinds of shocks in the future um, through more active planning capacity, reserve fund accumulations, and asset and endowment building. In order to get through the immediate crisis that we're now facing, it's vital for our nonprofit leaders, and especially those facing the greatest challenges, to closely align their priority setting. And if I can have the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. We're looking at aligning, if we can, cash flow projections with strategic planning that is kind of informing it, stronger decision making, and communications. Aligning all of these things is really the only possible way to overcome the increasingly choppy waters that we're all swimming in. And while managing through the worst of these things, we're urging our partners and our clients to give yourself some grace. This is a crisis that no one anticipated. No nonprofit leader is responsible for creating the mess that we're in, and that has upended so much of our normal business. If you can lead your organization to survive to the other side of this moment, that is victory. Uh, so we ask you to carve out space for reflection, but hopefully space that doesn't look backwards. We are not going back to what was in place before COVID. So it's really not the useful question or the right question to say, when can we go back? to business as usual. Rather, we have to ask, how can we best go forward in new and different ways of the kinds that you've heard from the various speakers today? So I urge and we urge people to take stock of the accelerated innovations that have occurred and how you serve clients and how the team works and ask what of these could serve your mission better. Letting staff who are more productive continue working at home rather than returning to the daily office commute might be something worth considering where that's appropriate. Maintaining the newfound courage that the crisis has produced for many of us to speak much more bluntly and forthrightly with our funders about what is actually needed. Finally, it's important that you realize you're not alone in this daunting challenge it's for the very reasons that we've talked about. There are many others out there who are struggling through this, and it's always wise to find common cause with others similarly situated. Many of our organizations and leaders need help. Our team at the Nonprofit Finance Fund is therefore offering accelerated education and advice that is timely and actionable. You can see on your screen some of the things that you can access. Other important organizations in the space, as we've heard, are also doing their share. So please avail yourself of these offerings wherever and however they can help you at this pivotal time. There's no need and no wisdom in trying to go it on your own. It takes a village, as they say in African proverb, and that village is all of us on this collective uh, exchange. So with that, let me just thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Uh, I know we're short of time, so I'm going to shut up and turn it back to our moderator. I guess, uh, Veronica, that'll be you. And I'll be yeah. happy to engage in questions and however I can be of service with the balance of our time together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. That was, that was fantastic. I do want you to do a, a little... Oh, my blurb on the book. Yes, do your little blurb. <laughs> okay, I'll... Uh, you know, she asked. Thank you. Uh, the, book, the book is called Democracy and the Next American Alliance, Where Prosperity Meets Justice. It was published by the University of Houston's Arte Publico Press in April of last year, 2019. Dave Sheldon and his uh, posse over at Southern California Grantmakers were very generous in hosting a book release event in Los Angeles uh, last year. And uh, you can go online, artepublicopress.com, and find the book. You can also find it on Amazon or other platforms where you purchase your books. It really relates to many of the things that we've talked about in this session. I urge you to read it and let me know what you think. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. I mean, you guys are amazing. So we have some questions now. Of course, we're running short in time, so we only have 10 minutes. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of questions, uh, but we, again, we are going to follow up with responses to any of the questions you have. Um, so let me go back up um, a little bit here <clears throat> for um, Jen and, uh, and uh, Carrie. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to... Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about this. Here's some questions. So with the increase in domestic violence cases that are being reported, um, 
where would you recommend that uh, people think about organizations think about resources? And that's to anyone here, if you know that. Okay, we'll find out and we'll respond to that. Um, for Jen and Carrie, how long do you track what happens through the partnerships? So we, um, we have a survey evaluation um, tool that we provide to participating organizations, a pre-survey um, and a post-survey when they're engaging in the negotiation process. We've been working, like I mentioned, with um, our, our partners across the country to come up with a post-integration tool, um, and we've yet to launch it. We're actually in conversations right now about the right time to, to distribute that survey. So um, that will capture the narrative two years post integration, which I think is where we get the most, probably will get the richest learning because we all know that um, strategic restructuring takes time. And of course, when we're looking at impact on communities, um, learning, getting, capturing that narrative takes a little bit longer. So we're looking at starting to capture that information two years post integration. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. Um, so <laughs> we can always come back. I think we're going to get it. Please, if that wasn't an, uh, uh, enough of an answer, if you could post in the chat and just let us know, um, we we'll, we'll, can we can go deeper on that. So, Michelle, I'm going to throw this one at you. What percentage of fundraising do you think should be less of the traditional side? Um, I would say at least half. Um, you know, I mean, this is where you get into um, the wonderful resources uh, that can be provided by uh, NSI and uh, by Tomas and Concerned Capital and, and others in their sphere. Um, because being a nonprofit organization, uh, there is sort of a lot of legal um, questions around starting social enterprises, social enterprises and managing your earned income, right? So I can tell you for sure, Girl Scouts has had to walk the line because they've had organizations within their network that if their cookie sales become, you know, above 50% or more of all of their income, they have to, you know, file certain uh, uh, paperwork with the IRS and all that good stuff in order to maintain their nonprofit status. This is why you see a lot of organizations um, that are new uh, popping up that are choosing to be for-profit social enterprises. Um, so this is a trend, again, when we look at that little, um, you know, graph I gave you, there's a real trend between folks who have now a choice of, well, you know, if I want to have a social impact, I don't have to start a nonprofit. I can start a social enterprise, right? And what they'll do is they'll do both. They'll have a for-profit and a nonprofit. And their nonprofit, the only reason they have it is so they can apply for the grants and, you know, have a gala <laughs> if they want. Um, and then they're for profit. They don't have to worry about any IRS rules that would relate to a 501c3, right? And then they can run that however they like. So there's a lot of different ways to sort of tackle that. Um, you know, even as a nonprofit, if you want to have a social enterprise, if you don't want to fold it under your 501c3, you can look at starting a different entity um, that would be a for profit. Um, and there's a different, you know, different options for, for how to do that. But again, that's why, you know, when you look at the services of the uh, other organizations here, um, they would certainly be able to help with that. Yeah, I think that this is not, this is not a new area. There's a lot of people working in this space already. Um, and you'll find a lot of times where there'll be a bargain sale or the, the, the owner has some sort of relationship to a local nonprofit and will use that nonprofit's not that status of that nonprofit to create a donation to help facilitate the, the, the sale of the of the entity or their bequeathment. I mean, there's a lot of people working in this space and there's a lot of existing structures that can be used. So I think it really depends on the level of risk that you're willing to take and how sophisticated you want to be in terms of your relationship to that entity. It could be something that your group works on and the profits are donated to the nonprofit and there's a very clean and separate, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, lines of business. It could be something that happens within your space. It could be something that you're leasing space to. I mean, there's a number of ways to, to arrange this. Um, but I think that the most important thing is always to make sure it doesn't become unrelated business income tax and business mm -hmm. income. And that if it does, that you know that you set aside and you're ready for those tax um, uh, tax implications. So 
I would encourage who, where, uh, whoever's thinking about this, um, this, this space um, to look around and see who, who else is already there and, and um, see what you can learn from them. Thank you. Um, so we are three minutes away from our time. So I wanted to just throw out um, a couple of things. One is that as we continue to talk about sustainability, please do reach out and um, if we can answer any of those questions. I think all of the panelists um, have positioned themselves as open to opportunities um, and we really appreciate that. And there's a lot of other people out there. And I think, you know, I really appreciate the panelists for wanting to be on the call today. And, um, um, but, you know, I think when you are considering making decisions about what happens to your nonprofit now, um, there, are, there are different tables out there that are coming together to talk about how to work together. So I would really encourage you to think about some of the SBA loans out there, you know, is that something that you can take advantage of to have those conversations that, um, you know, Carrie and Jen really articulate it well in terms of, you know, funders are open. I think David also really was clear about that, you know, that there's, there's a, a lot of conversation going on. And this time is really moving beyond the conversation, but it's moving into action. And funders are concerned not only about making sure that nonprofits are getting what they need right now for this rapid responses that that you know it's been it's been happening and i think it's important that we get some flexibility in our grants and all of that but the the bigger question for all of us uh, and i know for a lot of you out there on the line is how am i going to survive after this and what are the the priorities that i'm going to really need to take forward so i think analyzing what your priorities are you know, going back, just recapping, I think the mission alignment that Henry talked about um, is important. Um, and then ultimately in social enterprising, to think about it from a different perspective. So again, I know this is uh, now 229, so I wanna thank you all. So real quick, Veronica, we have a poll. We have a poll, I forgot to tell Veronica, not her fault. So really quickly, for those oh. of you who are still hanging out, Mackenzie's gonna shoot a poll up, just so we can get an idea of of uh, how useful this was for you. Um, so those of you who are still hanging out, uh, please do vote. Uh, which presentation did you find most helpful to you uh, and your organization? Um, just so we know how our information was received. Uh, super helpful. And um, I believe that's our only, host and panelists cannot, yeah, we can't vote. Okay. All, All right. right. <laughs> All right. So Michelle, is that the final? I think that's uh, it, right Mackenzie? We've got half, 40, 50% of people have voted so far. It keeps <laughs> going up, people are still keep voting. Keep going, yeah, the poll is open. You can just keep going, but you can you can talk, Veronica, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna just, Mackenzie, when, uh, when are we stopping the poll? So we can just give the final numbers because I wanna make sure that I am respectful for people's time. Yep, they're still rolling in, but I can, I'll end yeah. it at about 70%, so. All right, that's great. So what we got, you wanna call it out, Mackenzie? Yes, I just shared the results, but um, over half of attendees thought Michelle's presentation was the most helpful. It's not a contest. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. I great. agree. <laughs> Michelle, how many times did you vote? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I Rachel, know we're thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And we will be having follow up uh, opportunities. Um, please let us know if there's anything else that we could have done better, and uh, we'll be in contact. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, thank you panelists. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>